This is Eastman's Elevated Podcast. I have on great guests that are really knowledgeable, consistently successful. We're able to dive deep down the rabbit holes of these different subject matters of shooting, of physical fitness, of mental toughness and drive. All the different skills that make up a complete hunter that you can become. Here's your host, Brian Barney. Hey, what's happening, guys? Got a brand new Eastman's Elevated for you. So this week on the podcast, I have on Jake Downs. Well, actually, Jake Downs has me on his podcast, Earn Your Hunt Podcast. So uh, we had recorded one for Eastman's Elevated. We got together, recorded this podcast. It's just a great conversation. It's all about entrepreneurship. It's all about structuring your life to be able to hunt. Uh, it's, uh, uh, about like just different theories on, on, on work and making enough money to get free time. It just made for a great conversation. We also get into bow hunting and we talk about, you know, what makes us consistently successful. Uh, just really enjoyed the conversation. I wanted to make sure that I released it to you guys on this feed as well, as it's just got some good information in it on, um, structuring your life to be able to get more bow hunting. So, um, there is a warning. There is some explicit language in this podcast. Uh, it's not every other word or anything like that, but there are a few in this podcast. So, uh, you're warned, uh, uh, be careful or take caution if you have kids in the car or if this language offends you. Uh, Jake kind of encourages it on his podcast as it's, uh, uh authenticity or it's authentic. Um, and you know, it's a couple blue collar hunters or blue collar, hardworking guys together on the job site. And so there's a few swear words in it, but shouldn't take away from the conversation and hopefully it doesn't offend any of you guys. So we'll get right into this podcast. Uh, just want to thank a couple sponsors. I want to thank Silencer Central. Silencer Central is building silencers for hunting rifles. Uh, this is amazing. Like they'll help you with all the paperwork. They'll thread your barrel for you. And then a silencer is just going to reduce recoil, which is going to make you more accurate. Uh, it's going to protect your hearing so you can st still hear bugles for years to come. And then also... Uh, because it quiets down the rifle, you may get a follow-up shot at an animal uh, as it's not going to be as loud. So check these guys out. They'll help you with everything and every step along the way. They've got a great one for the backcountry. Uh, that's their Banished Backcountry Silencer, so check that one out. And just a great company, and we really appreciate their support. I also want to thank Sig Sauer Optics. I'm so impressed by Sig Sauer Optics. Um, gosh, I just love like those image stabilizing binos are incredible. And they've revamped the line. They put their high end glass in it. Uh, they have a pair of 10s, 12s, 16s, and 20s. Uh, I really like. The 12s and the 16s seem to be about right for me. I mean, the 10s are great too, don't get me wrong, and so are the 20s, but uh, the 12s have a 42 objective lens where the 10s have a 32 objective lens, uh, so it lets in a little bit more light. Uh, I just find it's like the perfect on-the-chest set of binos, and boy, when you flip that switch and you have a stable image, it's like you're glassing off a tripod. So check those out. Uh, they've also revamped their high-end line of binoculars. Uh, I have the pair of 10 by 42s uh, man, they're just incredible spotting scopes. Their range finders are the best in the market. I'm using the Kilo 5K, just accurate readings on light and dark targets. It'll shoot through grass with, um, I like setting it on the priority mode. Uh, now you put in the speed of your bow for the cuts uphill and downhill. And range finding is an art and having the right piece of gear really makes me a better bow hunter. So check out that range finder. It's amazing. And everything they're doing, rifle scopes, you name name it. Sig Sauer Optics is absolutely killing it, and uh, we're really happy to have them on board here at Eastman's Elevated. Also, make sure to check out Black Ovis. Black Ovis is an internet retail shop that has absolutely everything you need for your next hunt. Uh, they carry all the top name brands as well as their own name brand. If you put in the promo code EXTRA10 or ELEVATED10, you can save 10% off your order there at Black Ovis. Real knowledgeable staff that can answer any questions. They just do a great job over there. So uh, make sure if you need anything for your next hunt, you go check those guys out. I also want to thank Camo Fire. Camo Fire is an app where you can save 
uh, a pile of money on overstock gear, extra gear. They carry top name brands. There's 80 new hunting deals that come up every 24 hours. So you just download the app and you can check out those new deals and save yourself some money on some great gear. Over at Eastman's, um, man, we're just keeping busy. I'm writing an article right now about um, shot execution or executing on animals that'll be out in the next bow hunting journal. We also have the Eastman's Hunting Journal. There's six issue, issues of each magazine that come out. Uh, it's a great publication, great staff writers, great subscriber stories. I've read every one cover to cover for probably the last 15 years. So I love getting this magazine. Check that out. Check out our Tag Hub. Uh, it's our internet resource uh, give you all the information in all the western states and the top tags, uh, all the different weapons. There's so much data to go through there. It can really help you find a quality hunt in one of these other states. Uh, we still have the Mule Deer course. You can put in the promo code BRIANMDC. Save yourself a little bit of money there. Uh, we're working to put together things on the Elk Collective there as well. And um, Man, check out our other podcast. The other one I do with Dan Picard is fantastic. EBJ, Life of a Bow Hunter. Really having a good time with that. We've got a good recording that'll come out next week. That's a bi weekly podcast. Uh, we have the Eastman Hunting Journal. Uh, Ike's leading that podcast. The Huntsman. There's a, a bunch of good listening there. So go check out those other podcasts that are under the Eastman's umbrella. And with that, man, um, yeah, been getting in my training, good runs and things, things, life's been good for me, um, some really good fishing here this spring, so I've been having fun doing that, and, um, I'm, I am going to be up at, um, up at the Montana Bow Hunters Association in Great Falls this week, I believe the dinner is sold out, uh, but I'm giving a free seminar, uh, it's like 2 to 3.30, going to do it on Spring Bears. So if you guys are interested, come up. There's still room. You don't have to get a ticket. It's all free. Uh, so if you're around Great Falls, you can stop in and listen to that seminar live. It'll be this Saturday. And uh, gosh, it's in the convention center. Uh, you can you can Google it or look it up, but it's in Great Falls there. So uh, if you guys got some free time, stop by and say hi and um, chat. I'll have a little time after the seminar as well to talk to guys. So um, come on up. And, uh, man, I think that's all I got. Let's get into this conversation. This is a really fun podcast with Jake. You know, there's a lot of talk about entrepreneurship and being a business owner. Um, there's a lot of talk about structuring your life to be able to bow hunt quite a bit and also what makes us consistently successful. So, uh, it's a, a bit different of a conversation, which I really like, which, um, made it great. And, uh, Jake's a great host. Make sure to check out his social media, check out his podcast, earn your hunt, and um, Jake Downs uh, is phenomenal and uh, really like this guy. I'm your host, Brian Barney, Eastman's Elevated. Here we go. All right, man. Um, we'll just jump in, and this is going to be kind of a first for me. Not really, because I've had a few guests on. Normally, my podcast is just a half ass me caffeinated in my truck, driving down the road, just a mess, you know, after a hunt or whatever, telling the story and swearing a lot um so don't expect a real high quality what i want to do is just i want to get literally so i'm in new mexico listening to your podcasts your solos a lot of your solos and i'm like this guy is legitimately and i've i've listened to your podcast before but i really really honed in on it you the whole my whole spiel if you don't know it is earn your hunt which is Family, work, and hunting. So the two, the family and the hunting, or the family and the and your hard work is like what you have to do to earn that hunt. Some people think it's it's working out. That is a part of it, but that's not. You have to have everything together before you leave. Um, and to get to hunt as much as we do, um, it takes a lot of work. So. We're just going to have a conversation. I have no questions for you. We're, let's just have a have a uh, back and forth and 
say whatever you want, man. Nobody's <laughs> listening anyway. <laughs> it's perfect. Uh, this is um, uh, this is how I like to operate. I run by the seat of my pants quite a bit, and um, you know, and maybe I had the illusion on my podcast that I was organized or a good interviewer, but I'm not. It's all just conversation. So no, I'm pumped for no, it, man. Dude. Thanks for having me on. Uh, you're a, you're a veteran, man. I I uh, I look up to you and and. It's funny because I've been thinking about doing, I've got a few other guys that I want to have on. Um, and maybe I should have started with them because to me, you're like the epitome of what I, what I'm talking about in my mind, you know, like I said, you, you work harder, you work out harder and you hunt harder. So I want to have you on and just talk about like, uh, just some tell some stories about you know if something comes to your mind as far as as uh like a specific time where you know you had to put a bunch of extra time in to get to the mountain at one o'clock in the morning hike all night and you know what i mean we it's funny because some guys and they would look at you as someone who just you know gets to hunt all the time uh but there's a lot of hard work like it, it, in my in my eyes, when I look at your life through the lens of social media slash your podcast, I look at I'm like, yes, he gets to hunt a lot. He's on what two or three different podcasts of his own. And then you write articles for Eastman's like all of that is a actual job on a, opposed to your normal job, which is. You know, as a owner of a construction company, 40, 50, 60 plus hour weeks of managing. And, and uh, so just why don't you just tell me what, um, you know, I know people that follow you already know, but tell me, you know, what you do for a living. Um, kind of just run me through all, all your uh, all your ventures. Mm hmm. Yeah, happy to. Um, yeah, thanks for having me on, man. It's like the best compliment I could get is that, you know, another hardcore bow hunter is like listening to the podcast and getting something from it, like improving their own life. And then, you know, just like the compliments you gave me. Um, yeah, just mean the world, man. It's like a lot of the work that nobody sees and and you realize it and you see it because we're cut from the same cloth. It's like, you know, you're working hard at your electrical company. You're trying to manage your family, trying to do as many hunts as you can do, working really hard at them. So that's where a common thread is. And it's like when you can see somebody else's path or journey or understand what they go through, it's almost like a like a bit more impressive. But I really appreciate it, man. It um, it um I'm not just saying that. It, like, means the world to me. But, um yeah, man, it's like I started off – See, I, I was born and raised uh, in Washington. There wasn't as many hunting and fishing opportunities there, although there are some pretty good, like, steelhead rivers out on the Olympic Peninsula. I try to go back every year. But I got, after high school, um, you know, I went to uh, uh, the College of Hard Knocks. Like, I didn't, I you know, I didn't go to a university or anything like that. And back in the day, it was kind of like once you were 18, you were on your own. And um, so I got a construction job back there. I'd been working construction through high school. My dad had a small company out there. I worked for him and worked for some other guys. And, um, yeah, I worked for about a year after high school. And after that, I was just looking for opportunities and looking out west. And um, so I settled on this place out in Ennis, Montana. It was this small town in Montana, south of Bozeman, and drove out with a couple buddies, went and talked to a contact I had, got hired on his construction company, and just moved out with all my stuff, and um, I've been living here ever since. But when I moved out, I just fell in love with Western hunting and immersed myself in it. And it was like, man, I couldn't get enough of it, whether it was bear hunting or shed hunting, bow hunting, rifle hunting, whatever it was. And, and Montana had these long seasons, too. It's like we get a, a five, six-week bow season, five, six-week rifle season for elk and deer, and uh, you can take part in both. And so I just immersed myself in it and fell in love with it. And really, it was like another place for my passion. I was like a, a high school wrestler, and I I put everything. Like, I learned all these great lessons from my coaches just about hard work and effort. And, like, the more I would put into wrestling, the more I would achieve, you know. And so after wrestling, like, I had this void. And us as males, we really need passion in our life, you know. And so, like, that, the what replaced it was, um, hunting for me and I'd always hunted as a kid 
But, you know, now I'm turning into an adult and I'm putting absolutely everything into it. And so I just started to hunt as much as I could and fell in love with the process and then started traveling to different places, you know. And I, I had that construction job that I had got and I moved over for 10 bucks an hour. And, um, you know, it's like back in the day, you know, I had roommates and um, I could make it work, but I had like good hunting time. And my boss, he lived in the small town and realized that, you know, that we all need to enjoy our lives. And he really like would give me time to go. I wouldn't get paid time off, but I'd get time off to go hunt and not, you know, the time that I get now. But, you know, he'd give me a week off or an extra day on the weekend or whatever. And so I worked construction for a while and started to get quite a bit of side work. Um, it was like a year or two later, my dad moved over to NS Montana and I kind of, I kind of grabbed hold of his dream. He had told me about NS Montana. He'd been over here hunting. And, um, so I just, I, I moved over. I didn't have any ties and he had a house and stuff he had to sell. And he came over here, worked for a guy for a while. And then, yeah, we just started to get side work just through connections and things. And so eventually we started Barney construction and now it's been, 23 years or something and man it was no easy road and i'm getting a little long-winded here but man we would just take the jobs that nobody else would take the the re-roofings the re-sidings the tough remodels it wasn't like we had new house come in after new house and you know it got slow in the winter time over here and things but we just kept battling and fighting and and really what we believed in was our reputation in a small town and so we upheld that reputation at all costs you know always standing behind our work always doing a good job never cutting any corners and eventually we were able to sub for some contractors that would get houses and then we'd just do all the work and then you know eventually after 20 some years of grinding like you build a pretty good name and reputation and then you know able to get custom homes and things and so yeah able to get custom homes and then um yeah, throughout this whole process, just sharpening my hunting skills and really working hard at it. It was like I applied that same, the harder I work, the more I achieve. And I started, uh, you know, I was, I was running to train like I would for wrestling. And I was just reading and, and gathering any information on hunting and, and eventually fell in love with bow hunting. And it was like 2005 or 2006, I completely committed to my bow and arrow. I just figured if I stayed in a bow hunter's mindset uh, that I would be more successful and so I get some funny looks when I'm out during general rifle with my bow but I committed to it I was able to build these skills I was able to travel hunt different species and different habitats and eventually started writing for Eastman's and I wrote about 10 articles for free and eventually like I wouldn't leave them alone I said oh man I'd love to write a staff article and they said okay kid shoot us an idea what you'd like to write about you know and I sent them 30 the next day I was like I like overthought <laughs> everything you know and so I've been writing for those guys ever since that was like I think I wrote my first article maybe 2007 2008 something like that started the podcast in 16 I've got some other opportunities to film hunts and things which I always thought oh I'll be great at film right I like do the biggest adventures and I'll be able to put that up on the screen everybody will fall in love with it well then they turn the camera on and I forget how to talk into a camera you know it's like a just like a bumbling idiot and then um, you know and then too I get home and I look at my footage and I'm like oh man I caught a horn or antler there I missed the kill shot I just you know it was a mess you know but throughout the years doing it for free reinvesting in myself I was able to learn you know what it takes to put a film together and so I've got better and better at it like anything in life. And, and now, you know, I'm able to get paid for my films and I'm able to produce some good like public land, blue collar, do it yourself. So that's that's my story. A little long winded. But there it is. Oh, dude, don't worry about being long winded. My, <laughs> my followers got to be. Well, my follower. They, <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 it's. Yeah, dude, I love that story. And it's seriously, I think. That is like, so I get a lot of guys that ask me, how do I start a business? How do I go out on my own? How do I do it? And it's what you just said is exactly what happened to me. It's exactly what happened to everybody that I know that has a successful business. Basically, they worked in the field. As, you know, they worked for somebody for so long and they just, when you do that and you're, you attain a skill and you're, you better it, eventually somebody 
is like, hey, I'm I'm sick of paying the boss, you know, and as a boss, as as a boss right now, I, I see it happening with my guys, so I get it, I get it. But they're like, I don't want to pay him. How about I just pay you? Or maybe the boss is too busy. Can you come do this little crappy job that nobody wants to do? And uh, and you just start doing those. You do them. You do them. And eventually, there's no choice but to go out on your own. It, it, so I told people, I said, once you attain the skill and you, you know, side work is something that if you're not willing to do side work, then you're not willing to own a business. That's all I'm going to say. Like, if you're not willing to 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 work you know, your eight, 10 hours for your boss and then go work another four or five at night or on the weekends, you know, both days on the weekends, then then you're not willing to own a business. So start with the side work and eventually you'll have so much of it that it won't make any sense not to do it. Um, it sounds like that's kind of your story, too. Yeah. Well, and, and first you have to master your craft. Like there's such Absolutely. entitlement in today's day and age where, you know, I get a new carpenter that comes on site and automatically he wants to be the boss and start the bidding work. And it's like, bud, you got to learn how to be a carpenter first. Like you got to put your 10 years or 10,000 hours in. And so like I attack carpentry the same way I attack anything where I wanted to be the, the best I possibly could at it. I wanted to master that craft. And so here I am a young 20 year old kid that eventually is in charge of 40 year old men just because I took the initiative I'd work hard and you like when somebody teaches you something you learn that skill and then try to apply it and you don't know everything like experience is a really good teacher you haven't ran into everything but really pick something and master your craft and become the best at it you can and then like you say you'll have no choice but to go out on your own because you'll be getting side work or questions or other contractors will pass you work that they don't want to do because it is so shitty you know and and then you take it and run and then you have a business i think you know i I think that's how it works it is how it works and like you said i mean if you the thing is the world weeds out the people that can't there there's a lot of fly-by-nights in our town i mean if you got a truck and a hammer you, you, you're a carpenter, you know what I mean? And it's gotten even worse since COVID. I don't know what happened. People were like, oh, I guess, you know, and, and it stems a little bit from the fact that the bigger, more reputable companies are so damn busy that they don't have time. So these people that need a bathroom remodel or, or an addition or something, they don't have a lot of options because either it's too expensive to get the big guys because they don't want to do it or it's not feasible because they don't have, t- they don't have time. Um, so all these guys come through, but it's funny to see how many of them are gone within the first year or two, because they just either aren't skilled enough to do it and they, the word gets around or they're just not good business managers. Maybe they're good at carpentry, but they can't manage. And eventually, you know, they're buying brand new houses and trucks and all this stuff. And then all of a sudden, you know, The bank comes calling and those, you know, the the thing that people don't understand when you're a boss, like when I first started out, this is the biggest thing I noticed is I was taking a giant sum of money and I was like, oh my God, I was putting in this giant sums of money in my account. And then at the end of the month, it was all gone and it was all gone and and then some, like I needed to make up a little bit. You know what I mean? It was just like, what in the hell is happening here? So what I think happens is a lot of people take that giant sum and they're like, holy shit, I got $30,000. Let's go buy a new truck. We need a new skid steer. We need this. We need that. And I think that's what happens to a lot of guys is they just can't, they can't manage the money. So you've got to have that ability. Um, or, or attain it over the years, but you're right. I mean, it, it's not just something you jump into. You're not just going to be a high school kid. And I'm this, I, I quit hiring guys. I, I, I got two of them. I get phone calls now and then. And I'm just like, no, nah, we're not hiring because what happens is one, you do, you get the entitled asshole. It's like, Oh, Hey, you know, I'm coming in, you know, ne- I, you know, I, I got six months worth of, of experience. And, uh, you know, I'm expecting 40 bucks an hour, you know, six months or, you know, two months worth of paid vacation. I'm going to run your crew. I'm like, no, 
you know, my guys, my guys start at the bottom, just barely over minimum wage. I say, if you can show me that after the first year that you're going to stick around, that you're going to be a good hand and that you're going to, I don't give them anything. I don't give them retirement, vacation. I give them nothing for the first year. It's a horrible job, horrible job. But I tell them that in the beginning. And I say, if you work through this and you show me, I said, I don't even know what your pay raise is going to be at the end of this year or two years or whatever. It could be you might have you might have added 50 cents to your you may not be worth what I'm paying you. But you might be, you know, running, you know, there, there's a little difference with with, uh, you know, electrical. You have to have licensing and there is like a one thing I like about electrical is is. You have to be an apprentice for four years, then you have to take a test to run a crew. Uh, so it kind of weeds out the fly by nights in my business anyway. Um, but, uh, you know, I tell them, you know, you're going to have more, the more responsibility I give you, the more money I'm going to give you. Um, so I, I'm, I'm right there with you, man. It's, uh, it's this day and age, I, it's scary actually hiring people. Like, I don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> so, uh, how many guys you got work for you? Yeah, um, we're actually, you know, our crew is cut down. Like we were taking way too many homes per year, like three to five. It was just such good work. And we had built this mm -hmm. reputation that it's just like, I'm going to figure out how to do it and get it done. So at times we've had upwards of eight or 10 employees. Really right now it's dad and I, and I have a seasonal helper. I've got one kid that's coming on. That's a great kid. He's worked for me for about a year and a half before he starts here in about a week or so he comes back on Tristan. He's just a great hand. He'll be really good. But yeah, it's we're pretty small right now and I'm just taking less work and then more hands on and I actually really enjoy it. Like uh I just don't have so many fires to put out or so many yes. problems coming up. And I think I'm making just as much. It's just like charge a little bit more for the quality of work and yep. handle one house at a time. So right now we have two going. One's a seasonal house where I can only work in the summertime uh you know i wanted to have it done in a couple summers owners kind of dragged his feet making some decisions so now we're coming into the third summer which is way too long to be working on a house but uh we'll wrap that one up and then um i've got another one that we just started this past spring and i don't know we're maybe six months into that one it'll be a 10-month project so we're just finishing the inside but uh yeah it's, it's nice to have my nail bags back on and not uh, you know, like still have to manage the project, manage the clients, make sure ordering's there. But, uh, yeah, I'm just not trying to run so many crews around. It's really been nice. Oh, dude, you're preaching the choir. Like I've, I'm the same as you. Like I've never been real big, but I've had somewhere around eight, nine employees at one time. And, and your entire day is just dealing with fires just dealing with customers calling you about the dumbest shit like it's like how do you how does that even happen we used to mow lawns i used to run a i used to run two companies i used to run a landscaping company where we mowed lawns sprayed lawns we uh, put in sprinkler systems hell we even built a house one time my brother one of my brothers used to work for me i actually sold him that part of my business but he used to work for me and we, it was a time period where we were getting slow and I needed work for the guys. And this guy wanted us to build a house. My brother, he'd never built a house, but we'd been in construction our whole lives and he'd worked for a construction company. So I'm like, ah, screw it. Let's, let's give it a, give her hell, you know? So we just do a bunch of stuff. But what my job was at that point was just to, to run around with a, like a chicken with my head cut off and apologize for, you know, <laughs> guys not trimming a yard. Like I had a guy mowing for me one time that, he literally went to a yard, mowed it, didn't weed eat it, left and came back the next day to weed eat it. The customer called me that night and said, "Hey, what? You know, it's got they've got big uh, grass all along. All I'm like, this is not a problem I should have to deal with. This is not something I should deal with. And uh, so I'm the same as you. Like I'm when I saw there was a breaking point where some customer pissed me off and I said, "That's it. I'm done." I called my brother, my, my, I actually had both my brothers work for me. Uh, my middle brother, he was kind of, he never did any electrical stuff. He only kind of ran my construction, uh, 
slash uh, my dad's a, a flooring guy. So we grew up doing flooring. So that's kind of where we got our construction. We would do a lot of flooring and then the landscaping. So he would run that. I called him up one day and I said, Hey, I'm done. You want to buy me out? I'll sell it to you for what I have. Just the equipment. You just buy the equipment. You pay me for what I have here. I'll give you these jobs you're, that I've already got bid and uh, accepted. They're yours. And he's been doing real well with it. And ever since then, I'm telling you, my life has been so good. And I make the same amount of money. I make the same amount of money. It, it, it's just I have to, uh, like you say, I enjoy putting my bags on. This time of year, I don't really put my bags on because we do slow down quite a bit in the winter. Uh, to the point where my guys just work and I just manage them. I check on them every day. I'm in there, but I'm not really working because if I work, I'd make more money, but I'd have to lay them off, you know? So uh, I think being a smaller company, and here's what I've found. And I don't know, do you do any commercial work or do you just do houses? Yeah, I've taken a couple commercial jobs in the past, but they're a nightmare. So I'm all residential. See, and that's funny because commercial is my bread and butter. Uh, residential is where I don't make as much money. It's more competitive. Of course, I'm dealing with a, so where I, I found like this little niche and I live in a small town, you know, it's 3,500 people. I, I don't know how many people live here. Maybe it's 5,000 with our college. Anyway, it's pretty small. Um, but we have two other electricians in town. They're not that interested in the commercial work. They're not interested in the paperwork and all the crap. And see, where you're at, I can get it because you would be the general contractor dealing with the the craziness. All, as a sub, it's pretty easy. I just submit my stuff and they, they kind of help me out with it. Um, but what I've found is as a small company taking on a job that companies of my size, I've actually had people say, are you sure you can handle this? Like I get a job, I, I win the bid, and they're like, I've had two – Two times when they call me and like, are you sure you want to sign this contract? They, they think I'm way over my head. And those are the jobs where I, I was scared, but I made a pile of money. Like I, I, I paid off my house, my everything with it because I was working, you know, seven days a week, 12 hour days because I knew that was the only way I was going to get it done. But I'm competing against a company that is it's got, you know, two secretaries, at least, you know, two bidders. The boss, who fucking knows where he is, he's off, you know, in Hawaii or something, but he's still taking a wage. And then, you know, you got a journeyman that doesn't care about the company, or, you know, like five journeymen that doesn't care about the company with apprentices that really don't care about the company. So in all that, you want to talk about long winded. But what I'm saying is I found this niche where they have such a high overhead that I can bump my percentage up and still win the bid. And it doesn't always work out that way. And, and you know, you you want to get some you – know, I'm not saying I've won on every, you know, big money on every job. And, and I do assume a lot of the responsibility of those two secretaries, which in my case is, you know, I only – I don't have a secretary. I don't have a business manager. I do all the business work, which it sounds like so do you. Yep. You know, the, the office stuff, the bidding, the billing, the everything. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I have a tax man who takes care of my taxes, but other than that, I take care of all that stuff. And I've just found that that is like a perfect little niche for me. You know, I don't make a ton of money, but I make better money than I would by far just working for somebody. And what I can do is I can schedule my work. Uh, a lot of people are like, how the hell do you hunt 150 plus days a year? Like, don't you even have a fucking job? And I'm like, that's why, why this whole earn your hunt thing, that's why I started sharing these mundane things of me working and then going hunting and, and like trying to spread this word because you don't have to be in the hunting industry to hunt a bunch. Mm -hmm. It's not, it's actually, I think, better in my case because I don't answer to anybody. I can go hunt whatever I want, whenever I want, as long as the jobs are taken care of. So how have you... Explain to me how you work that because I have a, a kind of a system of, of where I want to have bids and, and certain jobs. Like I've got these school jobs lately that are, are a nightmare. Nobody wants them because they suck. They're on a timeline. But guess what that timeline is? August 
mid-August. It has to be done before school starts. So they're the greatest jobs in the world for me. So what what do you do? How do you manage that as far as uh, making time so you can go hunt, you know, a bunch in the fall? Yeah, it's um, it's it's never easy. It's I love the similarities, dude. I love hearing you talk about your electrical business and your community, and um, there's just so many similarities between you and I in this blue collar, uh, uh, do it yourself realm. You know, where we try to structure our lives where we can hunt as much as we as we want or as much as 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 we can. And so, yeah, I mean, um, it it's tough. It's like uh, my jobs. Like I think the subs have it a bit easier where you can schedule jobs and your jobs last and not you personally, but like a lot of the subs, no, I... you know, you get in there for a couple weeks, you knock out the rough in another week on the trim. So, you know, your jobs are two to four weeks or maybe bigger for like your school job and that. But when I'm when I'm contracting a home, I am the direct line of communication with the homeowner and I am married to that homeowner for anywhere from eight to 12 months and our community is different so we're a, a super small community maybe like 1500 full-time residents but what we have is like a blue ribbon trout stream what we have is like a montana small town and like everybody wants to move here and so everybody's building second homes and retirement homes and you know a lot of our homes are are real high-end customs and i'm not doing the multi-million dollar homes but definitely doing like you know, close to a million is my is my bid on the home that I'm working on now. And so really nice custom end homes. And then here it's like, uh, you know, subs, subs is tough. Like anytime you hire a sub and there's necessary subs, like I have to hire an electrician because of licensing and knowledge and things of that nature. I have to hire a plumber. I hire somebody to come in and tape sheetrock. But really like the subs have been a pain in my neck because um, they come in and they make extra profit, which brings up my bid. And then also, like, I have to be responsible for their work. And so a lot of these guys, like you say, the owners aren't the ones doing the work or the guys that care aren't the ones doing the work. And so, uh, you know, to hire a tile sub and have them come down and fuck up all my tile is, like, not a good option for me. And so, like, I'm a third generation uh, a carpenter and so you know we've learned how to do tile and custom tile showers so we handle about as much as we can in-house i do the concrete foundations the slabs we do the framing the siding the roofing we go inside like uh, i don't tape the sheetrock but a lot of times we'll hang it we do hardwood floors we do cabinets we do countertops we do all the trim uh, I paint the places after the sheetrock is done. So we really oh, handle as much as we can. And the reason is, is we are a small community. And when I started, like, not only do you have to be responsible for the subs and their profit, but uh, you also, like, the winter times get slow. So the more labor work that I can put into a house, the more money I can make. And furthermore, it does me no good to hustle through a house and then not have a job to go to. Now, as this community's grown, you know, like we still handle everything, and now I think it's more so uh, of just a, a quality control that I know we don't cut any corners. I know our work's going to be flawless, and we can turn out a really good custom home. Uh, so, uh, back to your question, for me to get the time in 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 my business is like I have a partner, and so when my dad moved over a couple of years after me, he worked for another contractor, I worked for one. We went into partners uh, with each other, which is great. Uh, also, my dad had ran a business in Washington. You know, I don't know that it was the most successful business, and so, you know, he's taught me a lot over the years, but he really let me run with the business of handling the clients and the direction of the business and really like let me take charge where he took kind of a back seat in the business. And so I was able to run things, get these projects, you know, make sure that we were making money, and we, we profit split in the business, but, you know, it was both dad and I that were doing the work now – where my free time came in is when I leave, like I can let my my owners know that, hey, I've, you know, Mark Barney's going to be, which is my dad, he's going to be your project manager. I'm going to be gone for a couple weeks. He's going to handle things and run the crew. You know, I make sure that I take care of everything in front of that so I can leave him in charge and I can go. And the one good thing 
there's multiple good things about my dad. He's a great person and great hard worker, but he understands that I work so hard all year round. Like I'm the guy that stays late. I'm the guy that works weekends. I'm the guy that makes sure jobs get done. I stand behind him. I answer all the phone calls to clients, all the problems and issues that come in. And so when I tell him I have a big hunt coming up, he says, go, go enjoy yourself. I got it, you know? And so there's still stress that comes in, but I have him that can cover for me when I'm gone that has the same level of, uh, of care that I do because it's half his business. And so that's the way I've been able to structure things. And as you know, he gets closer to retirement, he's been taking more time off and I just make sure that I handle absolutely everything I can handle and then leave a project manager in charge. And I, I make sure that I have a meeting with that project manager. Here's what needs to happen while I'm gone. Here's the, you know, pass on the homeowners their number and say they're in charge. I'm gone for a week or two. And not that I don't have issues that come in or feel the responsibility. And a lot of times, like I'd like to take more time, but uh, I, I run a business and I'm a responsible individual that cares. And so like a lot of times I'm having to you know, I'm not saying I'll cut a, cut a hunt short, but there's a lot of days that I won't hunt because I know things need to be done or I need to jump in with my crew and get these trusses set so that we can continue on with the roof framing or whatever the case is. But that's how I've kind of structured it over the years. Yeah, dude, that's uh, that's funny what you said about the subs. <laughs> so uh, I get it. Like your um, – I, I I don't know. I, I I don't have to sub much, but but when I do, I just got off the phone with a guy yesterday, fire alarm guy. Low, low voltage guys drive me insane. <laughs> I can't even deal with them. And I get like it is. I can't even imagine because especially you know with houses, you have a little bit better opportunity to say you know working not always but working with homeowners you can say hey this is a sub that it, we've used he's good he's honest this is but when you get into the commercial realm it's low bid that's it pretty much i mean most i mean some there are some that get weeded out by uh you know good contractors say we're not working with that guy again he screwed us whatever but I can't even imagine dealing with that. Every single job I've been on, my only goal in life is to not be that asshole that that everybody's like, God, he's holding the job up or God, that guy's the worst. But every single job that I've ever done has that one sub that everybody hates. <laughs> so I feel for you there. Um, but yeah, what, when you're talking about um, with your business with your dad, that's that's. That rela- I relate to that as well. I, I own my business completely, but again, I had I have had both of my brothers work for. As who I if I if I look at my phone, it's not because I'm not listening. My brother was calling, even though he knows I'm not available. Every single time, he seems to do that. But uh, I he, yeah, I've got a brother that works for me, and he's worked for me for a long time. My other brother took the other part of my business, but. What's nice about that, and it's not always true. I got a story for you. I'll tell you here in a second. But, but what's nice is they actually kind of give a shit. You know what I mean? Like, like you said with your dad, you don't have to worry as much about like the guy just not showing up to the job or or just half-assing it because you're gone. Because he he in some way, even if he doesn't like the fact that you're, you know, like my brother might get envious that oh this guys out fucking around and I'm over here making him money, you know, but he sees the fact that I've given him a good job. I don't complain. If they're 10 minutes late, I don't bitch at them. You know, I, I try to make it. And if they want time off, same, same with what, what you're talking about, we take care of it. Um, but, uh, the funny story I was going to tell you. So I was actually on that Ibex hunt, my last one, my, uh, in 2017 and on day like three, we were working on this giant um, uh, fire hall. It was a big, huge, giant project. We were right in the middle of it. My brother wasn't quite – I mean, he's 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 full-on trained now. Like, he, he can make mo- 90% of the decisions usually. You know, sometimes he asks me stupid questions, as they all do. 
but uh, for the most part, he can do it now. But back then, he was just kind of a laborer. What he had to do was super easy. He could handle it. But I'm getting these messages from the the uh, general contractor who is like he's I have only done a couple jobs with him. I actually got along with him pretty well, but he is hated by every sub in the country. He's not from here, but he's from another neighboring uh, city, town, whatever. And if you said his name to any of them, they'd be like, oh, fuck, I ain't working for that guy. Like they, he's just but the reason that most people don't like him is because he's a hard ass. Uh, so he's messaging me about like the timeline. Why aren't you here? Which he knew where I was at. But I'm like, what do you mean? It's day three of my hunt. And I've already missed one billing and had an opportunity that I, you know, I'm like, I'm already kind of in the dumps. You know, I'm just, I'm beat down. I don't know if I, you know, my confidence back then is not as good as it is now. And I'm just kind of down in the dumps. It's only day three and I'm getting messages from this guy. Like the job's not getting done. I haven't seen your brother in two days. What the hell is going on? And I'm like, Oh my God, I'm sitting on this nasty mountain, just fuming. I'm literally thinking I got to go home. Like this is a once a lifetime tag. I'm done. I'm done. I call or I text my brother and, and I'm like, what is happening? Steve says you're not there. He says, oh, yeah, well, uh, I've been sick the last two days. I said, you didn't call it? You didn't tell the guys? Like, you know what I mean? Like, and and now he would know that. And, and it's just no matter how good your help is, I swear to God, like I could go, I me personally, I could probably go work for you. And, and about once a month, you'd be like, what in the hell is wrong with this guy? Like he <laughs> – because you just it doesn't it's not the same level of responsibility or care because you're working under somebody you you care but there's something in you that just washes the 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 what you know like I don't know you know it just washes you kind of free of of responsibilities to a point and uh, so I know all about that but yeah man it, it's it's funny. It, it, Having family work for you can be detrimental <laughs> because um, luckily my middle brother, we never worked together because we could. We worked together on a couple like I had every now and then I'd have them come help us pull some giant nightmare wire and we would be this close to killing each other. Like it was just <laughs> not good. My other brother, Justin, he is more laid back. You know, he, he takes orders a little better. Um I mean, we still get in a few little, like, not arguments, but it's like we're short with each other now and then. But for the most part, it works pretty good. But how, how you and your dad obviously get along pretty well. Um, but partnerships are hard. Partnerships are hard. Partnerships with family have got to be the next, like, a high level. But obviously, you guys make it work, and it works really well. Yeah, we're able to work together, recreate together, and uh, yeah, we definitely have our tiffs as well. And uh, yeah, uh, my dad's level of uh, give a shit is like a little bit less for sure, you know? It's like, like you say, the responsibility just washes off, and it's like when I'm the person responsible for the jobs and handling the homeowners and back and forth, like the stress comes to me, so... Yeah, ultimately, it feels like I'm the one who has to get things done. But he's a great man and a great carpenter and manages things really well, uh, works really hard. Like, I, I have no complaints. It's just um, it's working with family, you know, and so, like, definitely have our tiffs here and there. But the, the one thing he he's really given me is like uh he he's given me the the freedom and believes in me to run this business to the best of my abilities and like you know if there's something that got missed in the bid you know he's the first one to step up and be right out there with me to get it done if there's a mistake that gets made or a callback he's the first one to be there with me to stand behind it uh you know he believes wholeheartedly in me and the business and i think what's uh, made our relationship go as he's given me that control over things, you know, given me the control over the crew, you know, because, um, yeah, it's, um, being a business owner, it's like, you know, I, I'm, I'm not the biggest asshole out there, but 
what I do is I like hold people accountable. It's like if you tell me something, I'm counting on you to be there. Like you may tell me you can't get there till next Wednesday, but and, and I'm fine with that. But if next Wednesday you don't show up, you're going to have me knocking on your door wondering why or looking for somebody else. And so I, I just hold people accountable to what they tell me. And our community – is different. There's so much work around that a lot of people can't even get subs to show up, you know. So you're right. I do have this team of guys that I work with and, you know, every house I've got to replace one of the subs because he didn't do a good job or didn't do what he said he's going to do, you know, but I have this team of guys that I trust that do what they say they're going to do. And so that's like a a huge part of this deal is like, you know, having these trusted guys that come in and do quality work. Are they the cheapest? Nope. But they do a good quality work, do what they say they're going to do, and, and then stand behind their work as well, you know. And so, yeah, we've been able to build this team of guys. And so, yeah, throughout having this business with my dad for 20 years, uh, we get along uh, surprisingly really really well you know we're just uh we're a team it's both of us we stand behind and step up whatever we got to do if money's behind if money's ahead with you know whatever the case is we're going to make it through it as a business you know and make it through it together and we do we run like you say i mean sometimes um you know, we don't have a secretary. We don't have an office. We don't, you know, we we hardly we have one tool trailer. You know, and the tools that we need. But we we don't own a great all. We rent a great all. We rent bobcats. Uh, you know, and and then pass on the uh, the the rental to the owners. But we run a real low debt business the same way I run my life in a super low debt life where everything's paid off, where I can keep the money that I make. And and we run our business the same way. Of course, we have the tools that we need and the things that we need, and we can always get equipment if we need it. But I'm just not going to buck those big payments and maintenance on a great all hundred thousand dollars. We just don't make that kind of money, you know. I but I I do see this. Some of these contractors I look at, I'm like, how in the heck do they have a couple bobcats, a great all sitting there? They got two tool trailer. They got, you know, it's like, Jesus, I I would hate to make all those payments. I don't think I'd make any money. So we run a real low debt business, and it's just a a small business that we're really proud of the product that we put out. And ultimately, the house that you build comes down to the carpenters or the uh, subcontractors that are doing the work. It does no good to hire a big construction company that has a bunch of drunks that are doing their work. You know, they, they may get your house done, but ultimately you got that guy that's hung over that's trying to put up your trim around your doors, you know, that there's gaps and it's not cocked right and he does it, you know. So, like, ultimately I really believe the quality of your house comes down to the guys that are doing your work. And when you hire us to do your work, you know, it's like it's going to be Dad and I that are there, that are managing the, the guys. We have, like, you know, we pay our employees really well because they have to be able to do concrete all the way to trim work and so you know ultimately you have these stand-up guys that you'd invite to your house after the work is done or you don't have to worry about them stealing a wallet off your dresser or something like that you know and so ultimately we're not the cheapest guys but we put out a good quality product and have a good reputation and that's been the reason why we've succeeded yeah dude that's it's actually comical like have you ever walked through a construction site like in a in a in a city or even just past you wouldn't like you would think that they those people in there they got them from the prison like it's <laughs> it's it's seriously i don't i honestly it's amazing to me that these giant skyscrapers and all this stuff is that they get built and that they keep standing i don't just like you said, I mean, you know, there's the quality of labor is a giant, giant thing. And the bigger you are, the lower the quality you're going to have, because it's just like anything. You give up one thing if you want one, another thing. If you want quantity, you're going to give up quality. And that's what that's a huge thing with with running a business is you cannot have that. And. The thing that I've learned, because I don't know about you, I guarantee you this is going to rhyme true for you. When you started, or when I started, I should say, I was taking any job. Like when that phone rang, I was so excited to answer it. Like, yeah, what, what's that? What's that? You you got a toilet that needs to unplug? Yeah, we're electricians, but we'll come do it. Like, I don't care. 
just we'll do anything. <laughs> um, and we did we did some crazy shit, like put up billboards where there were like wasps flying all around us. <laughs> we, you know what I mean? Like just stupid shit that didn't have anything to do with what I, you know, my business had. You know, we're up on a lift, and I'm serious. We're just putting up this billboard. And there's wasps flying around our head because we knocked a nest off. I mean, just really crazy stuff. But, but, and I would do it like right now. If you said, hey, can you do this job for this amount of money? What I bid it for back then, I'd say that I would laugh in their face. <laughs> I'm not, like, literally, I'm not going to make any money on that. So over time, I also learned and, and hard knocks too. Like I, I've always been the guy that was very anal about, you know, the way my wires looked in the panel. And like, like that's my big thing is, you know, and everything looks real nice, even though it all gets fucking covered up. I, I'm a very anal about we we mark every hole in the wall. We mark every stud. We tape measure every one of them so that those wires run straight across because it drives me fucking crazy when those wires aren't straight. It's all time. Like, it's all wasted time, basically, because it gets covered. Electricity doesn't care. Wires are all mangled up. It doesn't matter. That wire could go like this. It does not matter. But I care. So all of those things, I've always been that way. But we would never – I would never bid the job to be that way. You know what I mean? I would always bid the job to get it because I didn't know what I was doing, and I wanted it, and I was hungry, and I, I – uh, you know, we never lost big on jobs. We weren't making any money. And what I've learned over the years is my name has gotten better and gotten out there and whatever is I prefer to have much more in the tank, if you will, as far as is money. I mean, it's not a, a money grab. What it is, is I know that at the end of the job, if I bid it real tight, I'm going to be behind 100%. When you get to the end of a job, I still do this. I still do this. We, we're doing it right now. We're finishing up a job, and you think you have two days left. You have a week left. 100%. Like, I don't know how. I can't figure this shit out. But when I when I look at a job, like, oh, yeah, we should be done in two days. I know that it's a week. So I just tell people it's a week instead. But you, you just – there's always little things that that take longer than you think. So to have – more percentage in that job where you don't have to worry about it. And you don't need every job. You want the ones where you can do a good job. Honestly, I want my customers to say, if my customer went to someone and said, I tell you what, he's the best, does the best job ever. He's a little expensive, but he does. He, he's the best. That's what I want. I don't want someone to say, well, I got it for a good price, you know? Um, but, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm right there with you, man. That's, uh, I'm sure I'm sure my customer or not my customers, my um, whatever, my one listener, he's probably tired of talking about construction. Let's hear some hunting stuff. One one thing, though, one thing I got to ask you about the construction before you dive into some hunting stuff. What is what is your theory on um, like a young kid, like a kid that's in high school right now? If a young high schooler came to me like my son. I honestly don't care if he goes to college at this point in my life. If he wants to go into the trades or want to me, it used to be like you go to college. That's what you do or else you don't make any money or you don't get a good job. Well, I didn't go to college. Um, and as long as some but but I wouldn't say don't go to college, go work for McDonald's. What I would say is you have to have some sort of, of goal drive plan. But what do you think about what if you were going to talk to some 16 year old about, you know, the trades or whatever, what what advice would you give him? Yeah, I think, um, well, there's there's a couple different schools of thought. And so, um, you know, I've got daughters right now. One is in college, a sophomore. And then I've got another girl that's a sophomore in high school. And I think it's different for everybody. Like um, if I could do it all over again, I still wouldn't go to college. College wasn't right for me. I didn't enjoy schoolwork. I was ready to get out and go work and go make some money. But I think what I tell a young person is I think there's uh, multiple different avenues to success. And so I think, um, you know, pick a, a skill or pick a craft 
master that craft and eventually, you know, you can be a business owner because you're never that, you know, the dream is not to get a good job working for somebody and they own you for 40 hours a week and you get two weeks off paid vacation. That isn't the dream. The dream for me is entrepreneurship, like being able to set your prices and work for yourself. And so like pick a skill that you like or a craft that you like, whether it's electrical, whether it's building, you know, whatever it is, you know, or maybe you're a bit more creative than me and you're going to buy a coffee shop in town and you're going to run that. Or, you know, there's just like multiple different avenues, but I, I'd work for somebody that's reputable. I would build your skill, build your craft, uh, eventually be able to go out on your own and be able to make a living that way. And the, the schools of thought, like, It'd be great if we all did something we love to do. The reality of work is 99% of people don't love the work that they're doing. Like, uh, I, I'm good at carpentry and I enjoy building, but it isn't like hunting for me. Like, it's a job. It is work. But what I do is like you can, can build a skill or build a craft um, and, and you can make your money doing that by working hard and learning that skill and craft. And then you can use that money and time to go do what you love to do, you know? And so like, it doesn't have to be like, you have to find a job that you love to do. I love to bow hunt. So, uh, in turn, I go work hard at, at, at carpentry and, and at contracting these jobs to be able to get the freedom, to be able to have the money, to be able to go on these hunts. It, it does no good if you find a job that you love and you're making $20,000 a year, like you can't afford the time off or you can't afford to travel the West and go bow hunt. You've got to make a little bit better money than that. Uh, but I also like the advice that I, that I tell my kids is like, you know, find something you love to do, and while you're young, go for it. You know, it's like find something you love to do and work really hard towards that. And so college is right, I think, if they have a plan or something they want to do where college is incorporated in that plan. You know, my daughter wants to be a PA, and me personally, I would hate working at a hospital. I would never want to – but she's been able to work at the hospital. She's been able to work at the nursing home. She enjoys that field of work. And so for her, being a physician's assistant is right. She knows what she wants to do. And so there she is working at college, working towards this goal of having this really good job that's going to pay her over a hundred grand a year that she can then, you know, use to do, you know, whatever she wants to do. And, and for her, that's right. But I, I think, you know, there's like a couple different schools of thought, figure out what you can make money at, what will give you free time or figure out what you love to do. And, and dude, it's like, you know, wanting to make money in the hunting industry is a bit like wanting to be a movie star. It's like, sure, everybody wants to go hunt for a living, but very few people get there. And so for me, like this has been my side hustle is to, is the outdoor industry. And it's always been my dream. But, you know, when I started off, like writing for Eastman's, they'd give me 500 bucks per article. That's not going to pay the bills. I'm not going to be able to go hunt or put in for any tags to do that. But how I am going to do that is like I own Barney Construction and I work hard. And then this is my side work that I work mornings and evenings on. And I build it brick by brick by reinvesting in myself. So you can have a job that pays you. And then what is your love? What is your passion? We'll make that your side job. And so now in the outdoor industry, like I started writing at first and I was writing for free. And then eventually I was getting paid for articles. Not enough, but it'd pay for a new bow or pay for some hunting gear or whatever, or pay for a trip that I wanted to take because it was all extra money. And so I started building it brick by brick. But I think it's important that if you want a job in the in the hunting industry, like, again, you have to master your craft. You have to have 10,000 hours. The reason I've succeeded is because I've become really good at 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 bow hunting you know i've mastered my craft and spent on thousands of hours you know bow hunting and bow hunting in these different places all for the love of it so now when i talk on social media or when i talk on the podcast like i have weight behind my words because people know that i know what i'm talking about that i've been to these different places and arrowed these different critters and so so many people like a young kid wants to work in the in, in the archery industry or wants to work in the outdoor industry it's like you don't have a chance kid you don't know what you're talking about like you're going to have to put 10 years of work in before people are going to want to listen to what you have to say so are there other avenues to get there? You bet. It's like uh, pick up a camera and learn everything you can about a camera and start approaching these guys for film work. And sure, you're going to make 
150 bucks a day, 200 bucks a day. But once you can master that craft, you can make three to 400 bucks a day. You can have, you can make five, $600 a day. You master that craft with your camera by watching YouTubes, by filming stuff, by editing stuff, you know, and then you reach out to these guys and you get film opportunities to be able to go film their hunt. Sure. The first one might be for free. It's not for free though. You're reinvesting in yourself. You're building a name and building a reputation. Pretty soon these guys are hiring you to do film work and all on your side hustle, you can be building your own YouTube following. You can be producing your own videos to eventually 10 years down the road when you actually know what you're talking about and people want to listen to you. Now you have a following. Now you can build it. And so my outdoor industry has always been a side hustle where I build it brick by brick, reinvesting in myself. And it's for the love of the game. Like I love bow hunting. I love writing about it. I love talking about it. And so like all of this stuff I've started for free. The writing was for free. The the podcast I started for free and like eventually just able to build it up brick by brick to where eventually you know my side hustle has brings in as much as my main hustle or more you know I'm able to grow it each and every year the the film work I did it all for free I was an idiot for the first 10 episodes I filmed or the first 10 hunts I filmed but eventually you know what you're what you're doing and you know how to produce something and eventually there's companies that want to get behind you or uh, companies that want to pay you that see your value and, and that's a big part of it is you have to build that up and so everybody wants to hunt for a living but you know, very few people saw all the work I put in to master my craft or all the free work that I did for all those years. They just see me now running a couple podcasts and writing and filming. They're like, I want that. And it's like, well, you go back and put in the 20 years of hard work that I did and you will get there for sure. That's, that's it right there. I think the biggest thing right now is just instant gratification. Everybody talks about it. It's, it's, they act like this shit is new. It's been this – humans are just that way. Like everybody's like, oh, you know, kids these days. I guarantee you when they were kids, they thought the same shit. Like, hey, I'm going to get out of, you know, high school and I, I should be running this joint. You know what I mean? Like that's just young people. I was a moron. I still am. I, I literally – every time I gain like five years, I look back at myself five years ago and I'm like, I really thought that? Like I, I was an idiot. Um so I'm glad I'm not the only one, by the way. I'm an idiot that, as well. <laughs> right? Dude, it's it's the truth. It's the truth. And what 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 I what you just said is it. And and here's here's it's funny because in my whole life, same as you, like I thought I want to be Fred Eichler. Like I want to just go hunt every animal, you know, I want to shoot 30 animals a year and uh get them all filmed, get paid, just travel all over the place that sounds awesome that's like my dream that was my dream when i was a kid and then uh you know i i didn't pursue it as hard as you did as far as but i wrote some articles and i was always thinking you know i applied for some sponsorships and different things and and got butthurt when somebody said no i'm like well you know i shoot more animals than that guy why why'd you give it to that guy but what what it all stemmed down to like I don't know how long ago it was, but at some point in my life, it was probably actually I know when it was. I remember where I was. I was listening to a podcast. It was like on a Sunday. I was doing one of those jobs I told you about that the that the uh, one of the administrators asked me if I actually could handle it. And I'm in I'm in this building. It was like thousands of lights in two different buildings of, up at our campus. We were changing all of them. It was and I only had two guys. Me and two guys, and they were working six days a week, and I was working seven days a week. And I remember just I was listening to a podcast. It's like a Sunday, no one's around, which is my favorite time to work. And I'm just cranking lights and and kind of hating my life, kind of almost thinking about like what the fuck am I doing here? Like it, I should be doing something I love. You know what I mean? Like this sucks. And uh, I was listening to a podcast with Randy Ulmer, and they the guy goes. You know, Randy, why, why, why didn't you ever go? Why didn't you have your own TV show? Why didn't you, you know, blow up? I mean, you're, you blew up, but you know, you always were just a veterinarian and, and you, you know, you kind of stayed out of the industry kind of. And he said, well, I realized that I could make more money as a veterinarian 
And then I could go hunting whenever I wanted to. And I wasn't tied to anything. I didn't have to uh, do anything for the industry. I didn't have to, um, you know, I was not married to any companies. They didn't force me to do this or that. I could enjoy my hunting. And I, and I saw that I was getting to hunt as much or more than the guys that were, you know, in the industry. And when he said that, and I butchered that, I'm sure he said it way more elegantly, but I listened to that. Like I've sucked those words into my body. And that was like my mantra from then on. I'm like, fuck the hunting industry. Like if it happens organically, because like, I'm not a moron. If some company called me and was like, Hey, we need you, you know, we're going to send you on sheep hunts. We're going to pay you a hundred thousand dollars a year. You're our guy, which is never going to happen. But if that happened, I'm not an idiot. I'm going. (laughs) Fuck electrical work. See you, Justin. I'm done. You know, I'm done with electrical. I'm out. I'm out. But I don't need it. Like, yes, you're never going to love your job. And that's the other thing. Like, I know I've shared camp with some guys that have been in the industry for a long time. and, And it's not like they dislike hunting, but it's not as deep of a passion. And they've admitted it to me. They've said, man... It's I, I still love it, but it's it becomes a job. Honestly, in, in certain aspects, it's become a job. And I'm like, you know, I, I I never would not do it because of that, because I love hunting. It'll never like sometimes hunting just sucks. Like, you know, there's a lot of times where I don't like hunting. So I know that I would be more happy doing that. But but at the end of the day, I get to do something that. I don't love my job, but what I do love, I'm a, I'm a person that likes, um, that gains satisfaction out of, of accomplishing something and be able to look at something like it. Same as you, I'm sure you look at this house, you but fuck my wife's so goddamn tired of me going to places and showing her like, Hey, I wired that building or, you know what I mean? Like, Hey, look at that pipe I did, you know, like, like stupid shit. Like, or I'm in Walmart, which I didn't wire, but I'm looking at the conduits. I'm like, well, that guy did an okay job. Like, I like that stuff. I like to uh, make stuff look real nice. Um, so I do gain something out of my job besides money, which is what I think you were was good advice. What you said, you have to have a plan, some sort of a of a of a. If, if college gets you to where your your destination that you think you want to go, then that's what you should do. But you shouldn't just go to college just to go to college. Like I'm just going to get a you know, a degree in, in whatever, you know, in, in, uh, PE science or something, you know, or, or physical education and not be, that's what you're going to do with your life. I don't believe that in anymore. I don't think college is that, you know, that used to be the thing. We'll just go to college. You'll figure it out. I think you should come up with a plan or do a few things in, you know, in real life experience in real life and see what you like. Maybe you go work for a construction company and you're like, this sucks. I fucking hate this. I want to be in an office. Maybe you love that. And that's what teaches you that. So I uh, rant uh, <laughs> completed, but I guess I don't know where I was going with that. But I guess uh, um, what you said really kind of kind of struck a chord as far as is. Uh, um, Jeez, I lose track of what the fuck I'm saying when I get ran. But anyway, <laughs> no, no, you, you made a good right, point. You're, you're spot I, I think, on with what, what you said. Yeah, well, and um, too, like take pride in your work and who you are as a person. Like in today's day and age, if you can show up and work hard, and you don't have to be the most intelligent person. Like you say, I'm an idiot, you're an idiot, but I can figure anything out. I can think my way through something. And and so if you just show up, if you just get a job. And you show up and you put everything into that job. You show up 15 minutes early and you're rolling out cords. You take the dump loads after work. You show up and you put your head down. You're not on your phone. You get things done. You take pride in the workmanship. You'll work your way right up to the head of that company pretty quick. Like it's amazing. Like um, if you just have these 
the these these personality traits and you take pride in your work and you show up and two work sucks if you're watching your clock or watching your phone for the hours so you can be off work so you can go have a cold beer instead you show up and try to get as much done as you can like oh shit it's already three o'clock i only have an hour and a half left you know it's just it's all this perspective change you show up take pride in your work you work hard you do everything for that owner and, and maybe eventually your plan is to be out on your own well those personality traits are going to carry over really well to owning your own business but even if not you're working to the head of this company he's paying you well pretty soon like you are a major asset to this company so now if you want two three weeks off to hunt it's like you bet man you are the head of this business you run things without you it falls apart i'm happy to give you two three weeks off we'll make do without you you know so you can go have fun and enjoy your life and then come back and work hard for the rest of the year but uh, like really just this perspective change of like being the hardest worker on the job site. Like none of the – nobody I hire, nobody that works for me is ever going to work harder than I do. And if we're doing a crappy job of shoveling or bucketing concrete or whatever we have to do, I'm the first one to grab a bucket and grab a shovel and show you what work is. Like you know, just take that pride in yourself and in the work that you're doing, and, and you can work your way up and make great money in any one of these fields. Dude, there, that's a good – that's a good – thing to say too because i've had a lot of guys that are like man i I work for such and such company or whatever and how do you get you know how did you get your boss to give because when i was working for my old boss um he i i seriously would take three months in december january and february off completely off and go trapping i was a piece of shit like I was living with my folks trying to build, you know, trying to save money to build a house. So I decided that I'm going to be a trapper. And uh, I would just I, I literally I asked him one time, I said, is there any way that I could take a month off in December and just go? And he's he was like, yeah, I think that's OK. We're going to be slow at that point, which it worked great for him. You know, that was our slow time anyway. He didn't have to find work for me. So it actually worked out good for him. But also, like you say, had I been a piece of shit and not like worth anything, he'd have been like, yeah, you can take the rest of the year off. You know, I don't need you. anymore. <laughs> you know what I mean? But he was like, no, man, that's great. It's great. You can go do that. I always told him, I said, and I did this a few times. I said, hey, look, if you get in a bind, holler, I'll come. I'll just come. And it worked out great for both of us. He, he didn't have to pay me. And I would go and seriously trap every single day for two to three months. And then I right come right back in the spring and, and away we went and the way we were working and, and yeah, you're not going to get that. And you know, if you're a, if you're a not viable to the company and I know a lot of guys who work for big companies, they get a lot of time off to go hunting. And I just tell people like, just be honest, talk to your boss. And yeah, he might tell you, no, he might say, I, I can't afford it. I can't, I'm, if you can't be here, I gotta find someone who will. You gotta be okay with that. Or, if that's what you want, you need to go find something else that will allow you that time. Like it's, it's not an option. Like for me, it was not really an option. I was, you know, I was gonna live this life, and I didn't realize what I was doing. I didn't realize what I was trying to build towards. I just knew that I wanted to hunt and trap fish as much as I possibly could. And I wasn't, you know, making executive decisions like, oh, I'm going to I'm going to do this. I'm going to get my contractors. Then I'm going to be a, you know, work for myself. Like it was never like a a plan. Maybe it was kind of in 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 a in like deep down. It was a plan, but it was never like a simulated plan that I knew was going to happen. But as I got to a certain point and started my own business, I started seeing that, hey, I could go work my ass off and make extra money. And then I could go and say, OK, well, my crew is going to make enough money to pay the bills, you know, keep things going. I'm just going to go hunting at this point and they're going to keep thing, keep the lights on. And at the and then in the early years when I was doing some of these big jobs and I would get just this big lump sum of, of profit, I took all that profit, almost all of it. I, I spent some on hunting, but most of the profit and I dumped it into 
uh, you know, paying off loans, paying off. So I got in those early years, I got everything paid off. And, and then then it was really easy. You didn't have to make as much. You just had to have a certain little nut that you had that just in case money, you know, and, and that's grown over the years. And you had to have enough to pay the bills. Well, now you got all this extra money and, and now you've got some extra time. You can go mess around. And so that's where the earn your hunt thing comes from is I'm just like, man, it's not that hard. You can do it. You can mold it to your lifestyle and you can make it work, but it's a lot of work. Like you have to put in the work. If you don't just get handed the life you want, you have to work for it. No matter what, that sounds so cliche, but it's so fucking true. Like mm -hmm. it's just the truth. It's just the way it is. Oh, you're so right. <clears throat> yeah, you can, um, you know, if it's important to you and you absolutely love to do it, like just be careful sticking the carrot out in front of yourself. Like eventually I'll be able to hunt a bunch and I'll be happy. It's like, you kind of, you kind of just got to make it happen and then you structure your life and make these small changes to be able to do what you love to do and and both me and you had this burning desire and this love for being in the mountains and for hunting. And so this whole time like all these years we're trying to structure our life to have money to be able to do that and you know it's not my tax bracket to go hunt sheep. I mean I hope I draw a tag some I you know I can't go on these big guided hunts but what I found is like there's a ton of blue collar opportunities out there. Like you can apply throughout the West and you can show up with your truck and all your camping gear and you can hunt for two weeks and maybe do the whole entire mule deer hunt for a thousand dollars, you know, or, you know, there's like opportunities out there. You know, I've got buddies in Hawaii that come out here elk hunting. And then when I go out there, I mean, they host me, they dang near roll out the red carpet. They've got a rig waiting for me, a place to stay, places to hunt, you know, because they love to hunt elk and we're good friends and you know but you know the last hawaii trip i did i used points that i used building my house to get my flight those i mean i maybe spent 200 bucks and i hunted mouflon sheep and axis for two weeks in some of the best prime spots out there that's a blue collar hunt or you know like i uh been to australia new zealand i've never spent more than a couple thousand bucks on a hunt you know and so like those are my opportunities out there but the whole time I am structuring my life to get more time during hunting season, to have my bills paid, to make sure things are taken care of, so I can go on these hunts and go enjoy myself with a clear head. So, like, if you really love it, you're making steps towards that love or towards that life you want to live every single day, and it's – you're not going to get there. It is an instant gratification. It takes years uh, of work, but eventually – you get to this place and they go, hey, look at how much Jake Jake's hunting. Like he's hunting all over the place. Or look at Brian. God, he's bow hunting everywhere. And it's like, well, yeah, that's 20 years of hard work of being an entrepreneur and structuring my life towards my love of bow hunting. You can get there too. It's just a matter of making it a priority. It's That's right. I think that's the biggest thing is priority is a big thing. And I don't think – how many how many of your buddies – not – hunting good like actual hunters but how many guys that hunt say oh you're so lucky you're so lucky you get to go hunting all over the place and man i wish i could do that and they're driving a seventy thousand dollar truck and you know every weekend instead of working or doing something they're you know watching football or off you know i mean it's priorities like you if you want to do it there will be – I've always said like when you hit a crossroads of sorts in life, there will be two different directions. The one direction will lead you towards hunting and the other one will lead you away from it. And in my life, I never even thought about it. I just kind of eased that other way towards hunting and that's just how I've – and if that's what you want, it's just going to happen. It, 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 you don't need any kind of a road map. Your brain is going to pick the the way you want to go. I mean, it's it's subconscious, whatever you want to call it, it's going to happen, and you're gonna you're just going to end up there. And mm -hmm. if that's the way what you want, yeah, you, you're going to have it. So mm -hmm. I, I what you said is is dead set, dead on. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you good for a little bit longer? I wanted to hit you up about your training. Are you are you you oh, got to yeah. get going? I yeah, you, you said, bet. No, I'm good to go. Okay. I have no time limits on this. Nobody's listening anyway. Who gives a shit, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. um, hit me with, uh, I know, so I've been, uh, I've been running for a while now. Um, 
I didn't realize you were quite as big a runner as you are. What, so, like, just walk me through a, a normal day in your life. Talk about, and I know this is boring shit for some people, but some people eat this up, and I'm one of them. I, I, I'm doing this out of selfishness because I want to see how you do it. I just started um, doing 75 hard. I know it's kind of gay, but I just started <laughs> doing it. And uh, the main thing I need, working out's easy. Like, I'll work out twice a day, 45 minutes a day. That's easy. That's not something new. But But nutrition. I'm terrible about nutrition. So walk me through like your day and then kind of like how you, cause you, you do quite a bit with nutrition too. You're, you're kind of strict on your diet and stuff. So kind of just tell me all that stuff. Yeah. So, um, it's an evolution like any of this stuff, you know, it didn't start out with good nutrition or, um, I didn't start out like, uh, running every day, but it's just been this evolution where, you know, the same thing with wrestling is like the harder I work at something, the more I achieve. And, and I see the benefits of all this, of living this 365 day bow hunter lifestyle. Like if I work hard towards my goals right now, I know 2024 will be an epic season. So yeah, my day starts out like, um, Mornings are for book work, for podcasts. That's what we're doing this morning, uh, for editing, getting all that stuff out. And I don't get too fired up in the morning. It's like I'll, I'll maybe do some push-ups right when I wake up before coffee or in between doing book work so uh, it doesn't drag on or my pull-up bar is right outside my office. I'll, I'll do some of that. But um, really, I don't get too fired up. I'm more book work, uh, uh, taking care of paperwork in the mornings, and then um, – yeah, it just depends what I have going on. But almost most days, like I'm going to go put in uh, six to eight hours on the job site, depending on how long my book work takes me in the morning or if I have a podcast or something like that. Uh, finish that up. And then um, really right after work is my time to run. And so this has been an evolution. Like I've done uh, tons of marathons and ultra marathons and I, I didn't like to run. I just started like I run, ran to train for wrestling. And then, you know, for for hunting the mountains, like I just noticed like like the best way to train for the mountains is to be in the mountains. But I don't have the time every day to go ruck up to the top of a mountain. And it takes me three, four hours to get this workout in. So I figured out that running, I can put this high exertion on my body for 45 minutes to an hour. And I can put in the same work that would take me three or four hours of rucking. And then I also learned that like – elevation is the equalizer you know and so you know after these marathons i'd start to feel it in my joints and in my knees and i couldn't walk very good the next day or next couple days and i'm like i don't think i'm doing my body great doing these marathons like it's great for endurance and great to have something to train for and but i don't really like people anyway why am i running with all these people paying money to run on this pavement this is ridiculous but what i love to do is i love to be in the mountains and so I'd start running trails. And so everywhere I go, everything I do, I've got public land picked out where I can go run trails or sometimes I'm just um, uh, running out in the grasslands or wherever it is. And, and, and I just, um, you know, it's become a part of my life that I actually enjoy. And so for me, every day, I'm going to get my run in. And what, I, what I've also learned is like, you know, there's this um, – uh, this dedication to the crafter, there's uh, like uh, uh, this discipline of making myself do it every day. So the discipline of making myself get my running shoes on, no matter what, it, like yesterday, it, it was it was a shitty run. It was snowy, it was wet, it was snowing sideways, it was blowing. Uh, I had a podcast that I had to get on at 5.30. I had uh, under an hour, maybe 50 minutes, but I laced up my shoes and I went for a run and I got it in. Well, that discipline of making myself do that, day in day out i started to see the benefits during hunting so does that run i did yesterday make me in better shape or physically fit to where i'm going to kill a 200 inch buck this year no but what it does is day in day out i'm building this discipline of making myself do it making myself get on my running shoes and get out and i know being physically fit is going to help me in the mountains so i really focus on like elevation 
putting it in, but not every day is 100% effort. Yesterday, I mean, it was maybe 30% effort to go on that run, and I even stopped a couple times on the run. I just didn't feel great. I'm running through the snow. I'm, you know, it's blowing sideways. It's like, you know, but I showed up. I got it in. I'm back here, and I'll get it in again today. So this discipline of making me do it, like I'd see the benefits through once I came to season. And, and then I also, like it's been this evolution. So, you know, in the mountains, like, okay, so now I'm physically fit. I'm running. I've got this discipline. And also, like I'm building – these layers of mental toughness every day of making myself do it every day of finishing the run one leg after the other and you're just adding these small micro layers of mental toughness on top but after a year of doing that like pretty soon you're pretty mentally tough when you come into one of these hunts because these hunts never go as planned you're always going to hit hurdles it's never going to you're never going to go into your to your your first choice basin and there's 200 bucks running everywhere and you arrow that buck and what a hunt you know it's like it doesn't go that way you're going to get in there and there's going to be 10 other idiots hunting that place and you're going to have to hike out of there and hike back into a new trailhead and start over and you might have to do that three or four times before you find a buck to shoot you know so like this just all gets me ready for that season and it's a bit of like paying my dues towards bow hunting every single day so when I show up on a trailhead I'm under Undeniable. I know I'm in such a great physical condition that I can do it, but, you know, I'd have shortcomings. So, great, now my legs are all in shape. I've ran mountains. I can hike elevation. Now I stick a pack on my back, and, oh, I twisted my back out. Oh, my gosh, I'm not 100%. I'm 75%. So then I go back to training, and I'm like, okay, well, now I need to make sure that I'm getting in these body weights, the dips, the pull-ups, the push-ups. And, and for me, I'm an every-single-day guy. I just, like... I fall off if I don't do it every day. So, like, I don't want to blow myself up where I'm so sore tomorrow that I can't do it. So I'm adding these layers of strength onto it. And then I started to learn, okay, well, I'm really strong from construction and lifting. Now my back doesn't go out with my pack, or maybe my back goes out when I when I twist or I lift awkwardly. It's like, oh, man, and I notice that I'm... I, I don't have very good mobility or flexibility. I like I'm losing it in my age. Okay. Well now in the evenings when I you know, we have dinner every night at the dinner table or, you know, probably like six out of seven nights, so have dinner with my family, try to be engaged and laugh and joke around, but then I'll sit down with my wife and I maybe sit down, and watch T V for like an hour at night and it's a way to spend time with my family, kinda unwind, get ready for bed or whatever. And so as I'm doing that like instead of just sitting in the couch, now I'm doing stretches. I'm like, I'm pushing my mobility and my flexibility. Now I can twist awkwardly and I have strength. And now when I go on these hunts, I don't pull my back out. Like, you know, I don't pull my neck out, my back out. I've been doing construction for 25 years, the hardest work you can imagine. And my body adapts to that stress I put on it. And I'm stronger because of it. And so I'm always just making these adjustments. And nutrition was the same adjustment. And so, uh, like, I just started eating. Like, I'm not super strict. I just eat real food. I just stay away from the crap, and I eat real food, and I, I'm down to – like, I eat about two meals a day. Like, as I get older, it just seems like uh, three meals is almost too much for me. So I eat a couple meals a day, and I eat real food. Now, the adjustment I'm making is, for me, the sugar monster comes out at night. Like, I can eat good and be disciplined all day long, and, man, it gets to 8 o'clock, and I've had dinner, and I'm sitting down, and pretty soon it's like – like, oh, man, what do I have that's sweet in the cupboards? You know, what can I get? What kind of ice cream can I get into? I can talk one of my daughters into driving down, getting us ice cream. or So, like, for me, the adjustment has been is, like, trying to get rid of the sugar monster. And it's tough, man. It's like I still battle it. So, like, some of my tricks are like, okay – I'll, I'll have a, a yogurt and some berries or I'll have, you know, it just kind of just takes that edge off for me, you know, and it's not too many calories for me and uh, I'm able, but it's just like these small adjustments to my diet or if I'm going to eat, I'm just going to make good real food and like eat real food instead of eating the crap. And I, you know, it's not that I, uh, you know, I try to stay away from a bunch of carbs, but I'll still have some sourdough toast or, you know, I'll still have rice, a rice bowl with veggies and meat or I'll, I'll still have have a tortilla like I'm not super ultra disciplined about it I just make these small adjustments to my life so I can get the most out of my bow hunting season and that included is you know map scouting and research I'm always on my phone or doing research on the units I want to apply for the units I want to hunt 
Uh, again, I'm an everyday guy. So I'm every day I'm shooting my bow and I, I'm building that reputation, reputation to be like a really good archer. So I'm working on my bow, making sure that the tune is right. I'm shooting arrows every day and, and really deliberate practice. Like right now, my practice, I shoot a lot of indoor in the winter. I'm really lucky this new house, I have a 20 yard range. So I'll shoot indoor Vegas rounds. I can put a score to my shooting, but after I get that bow shooting good, all of a sudden I'm not interested in standing down there and just shooting arrows. Now it's like half the, half of my shots come from my knees or more. And so like now I'm shooting Vegas rounds from my knees. I want half of my arrows every single day to be from my knees because I'm 10, 15 yards worse from my knees than I am from standing. And, and I want to improve that. Or now I'm doing my weight training as I'm shooting my bow. So I have rubbery arms so it doesn't aim as good. Or, you know, I'm sitting on one leg and then just touching my toe to the ground because I know that all my shots come from uneven ground, you know, so it's not going to be. So I'm just doing all these little things to make these small improvements to when I get to the to hunting season or I get to that hunt and I show up at the trailhead. I'm undeniable. I know I can go in there, find a trophy critter and be able to arrow them. And so that's like kind of my my basis around my training or around working hard or what I do. Yeah, dude, like everything you just said, we live basically the same life. I mean, to a point, like obviously, like I said, you you work harder, you you work out harder. But you, you, everything you just said is, is is like every single guy that I know that is <clears throat> there's a different kind of hunter. There's the hunter and then there's the guys that are just psychopaths and, and we fall in that <laughs> psychopath. And what? What I mean by that is it's all – my wife would hate me saying this. Like I've told her a million times, like, yeah, gun to my head. Someone said give up hunting or your family dies. Like that's not even a choice. It's not even a choice. But beyond that situation, hunting is all I it's, – it's my narrow focus. And your family – I have two loves in my life, my family and my, and my hunting. And, but my family, it does push me to, it, my family, if all I had, let's just say this, and this, maybe this sounds bad or whatever, but my family is not a reason that I, that I work out. Cause I hate running too. I fucking hate it. I don't want to get up at 4 a.m. and stretch for 20 minutes and then go for a five, six mile run in the cold. Like that's not what I, that, I don't need to do that to have my family. You know, I mean, I just got to not get too fat. My wife will stay with me. You know what I mean? <laughs> so every and, and, and work wise too. same with work. Like I could literally have way more money. Like I could have a, a lot more money, nicer car, nicer this, nicer that if I didn't hunt. And but I, I know for a fact that I wouldn't because I would never work that hard if that w without the passion of hunting and that's that's what i think that us psychopaths have is we have this this it's always there it's always in my head it's always like like i said and i think that's why you know every time i got a i took a took a right towards towards hunting is because it's all that i think about so when i'm making decisions on a daily basis that's what I'm doing. And I'm just like you. I'm an everyday guy. I mean, I fall off the wagon. Eating wise, it's not even that I, I, I love sugar and I'm doing the same thing. Like I'm not on a strict diet for the 75 hard. I'm just eating whole foods. I'm eating whole foods, shit that looks like it should, you know, I mean, and, and I'm like you, I don't stay away from carbs because I can't. I could, you know, the thing is, if I don't eat enough carbs, my runs suffer. I, I don't run very good. Um, I'm just drawn down in the day, but I'm trying to 100% get rid of processed carbs and just eat like something good, fruit, honey, you know, and I, I limit it to it to, you know, and do mostly protein and, and healthy fats, that kind of thing. So I'm like you, I'm not trying to like, I'm not on the carnivore diet or, or anything like that. I'm just trying to eat things that are organic that look like, you know what they do when they come out of the ground or when they're shot, you know, animals. Um, but, but yeah, I think, I think that is a big mindset of successful guys, whether it's success in hunting 
or business or family life. I notice that my family life is far better because I'm a happier, more fulfilled person when I'm doing all these things. I don't run five miles a day. Just like you said, I don't run five miles a day so I can look good. I don't really give a shit. I have a wife. She's married to me. It would be a bitch to get divorced from me. So, I mean, it's not for that. I run so that I can be in shape for the mountains. And I've had so many people say, oh, running, running doesn't help you in the mountains. Bullshit. Like your cardio, high, the higher your cardio is, the easier you walk up mountains. That's all there is to it. It's just, just, I mean, yes, you have to have the strength as well. And I do lift weights and do body weight stuff just like you. But that's, that's, I think that is a, if you looked at, if you took 10 guys that are successful, I bet their lives would look exactly like what you just said. Two, I mean, there'd be minor differences, but their lives would look very similar. And, uh, I mean, that's really all you have to do is you just have to work for it. And that's, that's, <laughs> that's a good place to kind of, taper this podcast off because that's my whole spiel is just work hard and hunt hard and that's that's i i just i i find it that people they want to talk when you when you talk to somebody about hunting you talk on like there's a million podcasts about being fit for hunting and and what to do in, in training and this and that and it, yes it is very very important it's very important but it's not as important as in my mind, in my experiences, I don't even feel good going on a hunt or when I'm on a hunt if I haven't 100 percent put everything I could into whatever is going on in the business and whatever is happening with my family. If both those things are taken care of. Yes, now and then I still get homesick. Yes, now and then I still feel guilty that my wife is home alone with two monsters. You know what I mean? Like there is still that that pressure. Um, and I think I honestly think that 90 percent of guys that quit early on hunts is because they have one either not fulfilled those two things back home and they just can't get it out of their head. They just don't know how to mind mind that out of their head. Because it's hard. It's hard to think about your wife and your kids and your work. It's hard not to separate that, get that out of there. Um, it's either either they can't deal with that portion of it or they haven't gone to the work. They know they left something on the table at home and they got to go home and get it. And I, I, I think that is more the, what drives people home than physical fitness. Because I've seen some fatties in the, in the mountain. <laughs> some, I, I'm one of them. But I, do good. You know what I'm saying? That how to finish this off, tell me your thoughts on that. Because I think everybody looks at guys that go hunting a lot and they're like, Oh my God, that guy just has a ball all day long, just on fucking vacation, cloud nine all day long. No, you're, you're, there's always demons in there that you have to fight off. Tell me, tell me some of that. Tell me about how your process on that. Oh, dude, that's so well said. Yeah, you're so right, man. The demons, they'll get you. And so, yeah, I mean, you're, you're just so spot on. It's like you need to handle everything before you leave to make sure it's all taken care of. And that's your family stuff. That's your work stuff. And to be honest, the my most miserable week is the week before I leave on a hunt. I mean, I have so much to do. I am so overwhelmed, so much stuff. And I know now, like, to not be a jerk to my family because I'm going to be leaving for 10 days, but it's tough not to. Like, I am stressed to the max, and I am working mornings and evenings. I'm working 12, 14 hours a day. And, and a lot of times I'm working so hard to get all that stuff taken care of so I don't have demons that I'm packing the morning before I leave. I'm packing for a 10 day hunt in the hour before I leave. Now I've done it enough times and I, you know, I've got my gear and I know what I need, but it's not to say I haven't forgot stuff along the way because I am running by the seat of my pants, but I don't have this checklist of gear that I'm running through. And, uh, you know, my best hunts are the hunts that I can prepare for, you know, a week in advance and start setting my gear out and thinking about. But a lot of these hunts I'm hunting so much, I am taking care of the demons first and foremost. And then I'm throwing all my gear in the truck in a 45 minute scramble and I'm off to try to go hunt, you know. And so like um, making sure 
like how you do one thing is how you do everything. And so I can't just be a good bow hunter. Like I have to be a good father and a good husband. I have to be a good business owner. I have to make sure all these responsibilities are taken care of and so I can be gone and I can enjoy my trip. Otherwise, those demons will come up and haunt me because I've left things undone. You know, I've left a mess back home. I'm going to have to come back to a hornet's nest. And I've just done this enough times where it's like, no, I'm going to tell people I'm going to be gone. I'm going to organize and orchestrate my life so I can be gone. I know that my family is like taking care of things and uh, taking care of the household while I'm gone, even if something comes up. And, and they plan for this time to take care of me. So the last thing I'm going to do is come home early. I've worked way too hard i've taken care of everything my family is working way too hard for me to come home because i can't find a deer or whatever i'm just gonna keep hunting until i do find one because i know that effort eventually pays off but yeah man you're so spot on as you just can't have those demons haunting you and i think you're right i think you know it's not physical fitness that kills guys i mean sure it helps and and, and definitely helps me, and I build that mental toughness. I'm able to push forward. Like uh, It all works together in unison, but the biggest thing that I think ruins most hunts is like – having those demons pop up in your head of your family or of your, you know, and I know, you know, me and my wife have been doing this for so long that I just know that things are taken care of. I know that she's going to step up. I know that, you know, she supports me wholeheartedly. And then in turn, when I'm home, you know, I have to support her and spend quality time. I have to plan family vacations. And luckily I don't think she'll be listening to your podcast, but yeah, I mean, I got to go do a cruise and I hate cruises. I hate them with every fiber of my being. They are the absolute worst thing. I hate spending the money. I hate going on them, but you know what? My wife loves them and we're taking the kids and it's a vacation they want to do. So you know what? I'm going to put the biggest smile on my face and I'm going to go have fun with my family. I'm going to go spend way more money than I'll spend in a year of hunting. And we're going to go have a good time because I know that she supports me when I want to go on that muley hunt or that elk hunt or whatever it is you know so i think that's like such a, a major part of being successful in hunting is like just being a responsible individual and taking care of uh the necessities that you need to take care of before you leave both with your family and with work yeah it's money you nailed it that's that's the good place to end it i you that's exactly right that's exactly right family I'm the same way. If if we there are times when I'm like, I you know just just some certain things that you just don't want to do. And with you know I I would probably honestly that's the whole point of of the earn your hunt. Like some people don't get it. That's that's your family. The things that you do with your family are things that you always are going to do with your family. Like you, you don't need hunting to make you love your family or do go on cruises and stuff, no matter what, you'd hate that. And you would do it no matter what without hunting, you would do it. But what I think the caveat is, is hunting makes it better because you know that you're kind of like a little bit of part of you is like, Hey, you know, I'm doing this for them and they're going to step up when I'm gone. And, and you feel better about it. I, I just think hunting makes everything worthwhile just a little more than than it was and and that's the whole point i well man i i sure appreciate all your time i know you're busy and uh i gotta take a leak anyway i i uh and also thanks for for recording this for me we'll uh we'll definitely do it again because actually what i want to do next time is i want to do a hunt no, normally if i have a guest on it's because we're either sitting in camp or we're you know, hunting and we're driving from area to area or doing something and we're in the pickup and we just do a podcast. But, uh, one of these days, man, me and you got to figure something out. We'll go do, go kill something together and we'll do it again. Yeah. hundred percent. Well, this is going to be a regular show, Jake. Um, yeah, I, I like this. Uh, I really, I, I love your message and, um, uh, what you're putting out there to guys. So, uh, we'll share this on, um, uh, your feed there. I'll, I'll send you over this podcast and we'll push it on my side on social and then I'll probably release it on my side as well. A few weeks later, just to introduce it to my audience, just because, 
I love the message so much. Like I don't get to talk about this stuff with another blue collar bow hunter like yourself that's like structured their life towards bow hunting. And so, you know, I've done over 400 and some episodes of my podcast. Uh, this was a first, you know, and so um, I, it's just a great conversation. I really appreciate you. Let's put together that hunt and make this a regular thing. Thanks. That sounds good, man. Well, uh, yeah, we can jump on yours anytime. There's a lot of this message that I think it would be good for uh, it. It's there's so many people that are in our realm that would benefit from our stories because I've benefited from somebody saying something and I'm like, oh, I can do that. You know what I mean? Like, it's just like I never thought about it. So, yeah, man, let's let's uh, let's make it happen. Yeah. Send her over. I appreciate it. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I, my this will probably go out next week. I just recorded one for this week. I'm not. I I don't have any in the queue. I just record them week by week and put them out. So I'll I'll send it out next week, and then uh, um, I'll obviously tag you in it on social, and then uh, yeah, let me know when you want to put it out. And uh, hopefully we didn't offend anybody. I, like I said, I got a potty mouth a little bit. I I tamed it down a little bit with you. <laughs> But, uh, man, no, it was a great conversation. Yeah. And I think a lot of people, um, gain a lot of, of just certain, like there's so many podcasts that are just about the same stuff over and over and that's all great. But I think there's, there's definitely, um, there's not a lot of people talking about this portion, you know, the rest of it, the lifestyle. Yeah. No, that's um, that's exactly it. Well, and it's how men talk, and I I usually tame it down a bit for my podcast. Or there's a few that slip in there for sure, but it's just how men talk, and it's like I'm a fan of um, uh, the English language, and and to use a swear word here and there, it's like uh, uh to not use it is is a detriment to what you're trying to say. Like it 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 provides emphasis to the statement that you're saying, and really this is how we talk on a construction site, and I'm a huge fan of authenticity of being who you are you know so uh it was really nice to to let loose and be able to let a few of those swear words go i'll tell you right now if i heard two guys say they were construction workers talk for two hours and they didn't swear once (laughs) i'd say bullshit you're not construction workers you're probably (laughs) uh, they're they're engineers i bet (laughs) (laughs) that's so true well thanks dude yeah send it over and stay in touch yeah we'll uh We'll definitely get something lined up. We will. Let's keep in touch, man. I appreciate you. Thanks, you too, man. Okay. All right. Bye. Later. All right, guys. And that's a wrap. I can say a fun conversation with Jake. Thanks uh, to him for having me on. Really enjoyed it and uh, really enjoyed the discussion. I, um, you know, it's 430 episodes or something on this podcast and it's, um, it's kind of fun when I get to dive into different subject matter that I haven't really discussed on the podcast and hopefully can, um, allow you guys to like think about your careers or think about your life and how you can get a few more days of field or how you can get a little bit more freedom or make a little bit more money. So, um, yeah, it was just a great conversation. Really enjoyed it. So thanks to Jake again for letting me share this podcast on our feed and, um, Thanks to Eastman's for everything they do and also our sponsors. So uh, just want to thank Silencer Central, Sig Sauer Optics, Black Ovis, and Camel Fire. Check those guys out. Uh, check out everything we're doing at Eastman's or other podcasts, uh, the the magazines, uh, the Tag Hub. We have like about everything you can have for to help you guys be more successful in Western hunting. So check those out. I really think they're a deal. Um, I use all – I use all – everything that we put out to help um, make myself a better bow hunter and I think it's a great tool that you guys can use as well so um, life's good around here got that uh, Matthews absolutely dialed in shooting and ready for spring bear sight tape made using those new um, g5 arrows they came on as a um, sponsor for EBJ which is great and um, so yeah using those things really great components um, yeah five mil arrow. Uh, they're just flying super, really grouping good for me. So super stoked about that. Getting in some good runs, some good training and things. And then, um, man, I've just been fishing lately. It's not a fishing podcast, I know, but I just love fly fishing and hunting these browns. I see so much 
correlation between my fishing and my hunting and um i just love the winter and spring season like being on the rivers like being outside and and having these experiences in nature just the same as hunting and um good friends and good laughs and um seeing some uh great brown trout here and um yeah, just having a ton of fun doing that and going so hard. Like the other day, I think I started at five in the morning, left my house, and then I think I got home at um, about 1030 at night. So it was just absolutely all day. I did a good three day or where we set up the wall tent, fished a system, and um, it's just a pile of fun for me. I just, um, I, I, I just, uh, it's definitely my other love besides bow hunting and so, yeah, I've been spending some time doing that, super stoked on that, and uh, just getting ready for Spring Bear here as it's getting ready to open up. I'm going to give that seminar in Great Falls. Again, it's free, and uh, you guys are welcome to show up this Saturday and listen to that seminar if you get this before then. So, um, man, thanks, uh, thanks a bunch for the support, guys, and listening in each and every week, and thanks to Jake for uh, letting me share this podcast. Go check out everything he's working on and doing. Just a great bow hunter and a great insight into what it takes. So, uh, thanks, you guys. With that, I'll check in with you next week.